What a joy to be at CCC today and had a wonderful, as Jim said, conference and was so uh, delighted that God gave me the privilege to be able to stand behind this pulpit and share with your wonderful women. I do want to say thank you to the Schmitz. What a wonderful pastoral couple God has blessed you with and um, a wonderful pastoral team that has greeted me and been so gracious to me and uh, that says a lot to a guest that's coming into a church. Your first impressions are top notch. I love the way, the warmth that I feel when I come into this place. I can tell that you love Jesus and you're about what he's about. And that's awesome. I, I want to say that um, fulfillment of your potential hinges on the level of your courage. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few moments and I wanna unpack that with you. We're gonna talk about courage today. But first, I brought my family with me, but I had to bring them with me through technology. And so I'd like for that picture to come up on the screen. And um, yeah, that handsome hunk in the middle sitting with me is my husband of 40 years. And uh, we were a statistic. And uh, people didn't believe we, uh, we would make it, but we proved them wrong. When God's in the middle of it, it's amazing what God can do. He gave us three beautiful children, uh, and they married three wonderful spouses that we prayed for from the time our children were just young. And I will say that all three of them are in full-time ministry. Uh, my husband will often say, we're not in the family business. Ministry is not the family business. It just happens to be that when you're called, you say yes. And uh, we're so grateful that all three of our children are doing amazing things for God, but I can't not leave off the splendiferous seven because the splendiferous seven are our seven grandchildren and uh, they range from five up to almost 18. Now this is when okay now this is when the breath should be taken out of the air like that woman has a grandson that's almost 18 how is that possible <laughs> so now nah, I know <laughs> When our oldest in the picture, he's actually standing uh, behind us, behind the couch there. He pastors a, a thriving church in Texas. And Jeremy, when he was 14, it was so funny. We were on family vacation and we were going to be seeing more family. And so we headed to um, our destination. We get to the destination, but what was so exciting for Jeremy at 14 was that he was ready to be able to sit down at the table and take on the family, family championship of arm wrestling. So we get to the destination and cousins are gathering. I mean, it was a big deal. So there's everyone standing around the table. We're cheering, and, cheering Jeremy on and the bell rang. We even had a bell and it was, it was time for the arm wrestling to begin. It was three seconds. It was done. And Jeremy's arm was pinned to the table by the family champion, his grandmother. <laughs> so let me tell you that you remember when you go back to school and they want you to do the highlight reel of what happened in summer? That did not make the highlight reel. <laughs> But he did have some strength and courage. And, you know, my husband's uh, mom stands at five feet. She's an incredible woman of God. Regrettably, she has dementia now, and we're losing her. But I will say that in that day, when Jeremy was 14, she was just this little, little thing, owned a couple of hairdressing salons. But when she would get home from work, she would help her husband, who was a carpenter by trade, my husband's father, but he was also a dairyman. And so she would milk those cows. So I'm telling you, she was strong. <laughs> and so I'm not sure if Jeremy ever did try again. I don't think he did. Today, we're going to dive in and we're going to take a closer look at courage. What is courage? We're going to look at Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Jen made reference to it. And I will tell you this, familiarity breeds invisibility. And what I mean by that is that this is 
a passage that probably most of us, if you have been following Christ, if some of you are here kind of kicking the tires, maybe someone invited you and you're not very familiar with the Bible, then obviously this will be new to you. But if you are familiar, I want to encourage you, please don't allow your familiarity to produce invisibility because the Holy Spirit, I have found over the many years that I've been serving God that I can pick up the word of God and even read a passage that I've read several times and God by his spirit will show me something fresh. And that's what I am praying for today, that God will show us something fresh in his word that we can take with us and that it will make a difference. So let's look at it together, Joshua 1 and it's 1 through Nine. Now, this is God's commissioning service, if you will, to Joshua. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place that you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean. Mediterranean Sea in the West. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land. I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not Turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do, do, to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen? And I believe that's a rhema word for us today. He will never leave us. And if we will be strong and courageous, we can be prosperous and successful in the eyes of God. There's three highlights that stand out to me, and I want to share those with you this morning. The first is courageous transition. You will notice in verses 1 through 4 that there's um, a transition of leadership. There's a transition of locality. There's a transition of a specific trajectory. So the boundary lines, as the proverb said, were set to fall in pleasant places. However, the people needed to activate and actuate the promise. Do you know what's so cool about God's promises? Is that the word of God says that he backs his promises by the word of his name. And so we know that the promises are backed by his name. So I want you to notice these key elements in courageous transition. One, we grieve forward. And I know I have a, a slide for that, but grieve forward. Moses was dead. Moses had an immense task. He exerted a unique force in the shaping of a nation. He is the model of a visionary leader. The Israelites grieved for Moses 30 days in the plains of Moab. Now, this was not unusual. Typically, they would grieve for at least seven days, which meant that they would just stop everything. But on this particular occasion with Moses being the leader that he was, they took 30 days, they stopped, they did nothing but grieve over this great leader. So grief is a sign of healthy closure. We grieve different types of losses, a death, a job, transition. You know, often those that grieve deepest, and you probably have seen this, those that grieve deepest are the ones that maybe have the depth of connection that others do not have or strong ties to a person or situation. You know, Joshua was deeply affected by this death, but God knew Joshua's propensities. God knows our propensities, the inclinations. He knows our DNA. 
And so isn't it interesting that he tells him three times to be strong and courageous because he knew that Joshua needed to hear that. It's very likely that Joshua was concerned about the future. Can I really go forward from here? Without Moses, am I enough? Am I smart enough? Am I good enough? Will they respect me? And what I want to encourage you in this place, maybe you've lost a job. Maybe there's been a relationship. Maybe there's someone young in here who's been in a relationship for a couple of years and God has convicted you. And you've let go of that relationship, yet you're grieving it. And I want to encourage you, grieve forward. Because when God speaks, he's going to take care of you. Grieve forward. And you say, okay, God, what's next? And that's what Joshua was saying. So under courageous transition, it, it also involves adopting change. So I'd just like to ask, how many in here would say that you are an early adopter? Like when Pastor Schmidt gets on the platform and he is excited and he begins to share with you a vision that God has given him and perhaps he shared it with the elders and the deacons and his pastoral staff and he gets up and he says, we're taking this mountain and he's just sharing it with enthusiasm. Would you raise your hand? How many of you are, are early adopters? Like you think, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, and this is what I figured. They're scattered through. How many of you, it just takes a little bit of time. You're, you think, yeah, it's a great idea, but I want to just kind of check it out. You know, just, just let me check it out, and then I'll jump in. How many of you are in that place, okay? And then how many of you are a little bit late adopters? Like, you hear him, and you love your pastor, and you want to back him, and you want to be behind him, yet you want to see it first. Like, like you know, it's, a, it's an experiment, it's a pilot project. Let's see how well it works. And then if it works well, okay, I'll jump on that train now. Any of you? Okay. <laughs> I love the honesty. Every church has those three types of adopters. But I will tell you, change is inevitable. You know that. But change, though it is inevitable, misery in the change is optional. You get to choose whether or not you will be miserable. Transition is expected in life. There's a lot of leaving in life. We must leave to move forward. Sometimes it's leaving the locale. Other times it's leaving an established system to embrace a new system. Change also occurs when you stay and others may leave. Constantly embracing a new normal. We did this when we had the empty nest and all three of our adult children, you know, left the home. I, I'll never forget, we were at a network meeting and a pastor came up to me and he sidled up and he kind of did this to my shoulder and he said, guess what? And I said, what is it? And he, and he knew we were grieving over the empty nest and he said, the empty nest, it ain't all bad. <laughs> and we've discovered that, it ain't all bad. I will say this, Joshua faced change with a courageous mindset. Each battle was unique. The crossing of the Jordan looked different than the battle at Ai. The battle at Ai looked different than the march around Jericho. But the emotional fortitude of courage remained consistent. He took God serious. He took God at his word. I believe you're a people that wants to take God at his word. Joshua was told, I'll give you every place that you set your foot. And that's exactly what happened. Under Joshua's leadership, they gained control of 31 kingdoms. That's pretty amazing. But God was up to his word. And he said, Joshua, you step out and I'll give it to you. And that's exactly what happened. The goal for us when change comes our way, I would encourage you to ask yourself, a couple of questions. Despite the change I'm facing, how well am I manifesting the character of Jesus? Because change is going to come for all of us. But how well are we going to manifest the character of Christ in our life? Another question is this. Although change is out of my control, what message is my current attitude sending others? Some of you in this place have a lot of influence. Others have maybe smaller influence, but everyone 
has influence. So what is my attitude sending others? May God help us that our attitudes are always focused on Christ. We may not always understand. We may not always be able to explain, but yet we want our attitude focused on Jesus. Another area in courageous transition is nullify doubt. I found it fascinating in doing some research. In 1978, two psychologists at Georgia State University discovered a syndrome they called the imposter phenomenon. Now, I'm probably going to set myself up here, but how many of you like the movie Elf? Anyone besides me? <laughs> a few of you. I love Elf. I, I know it's not about Jesus' birth, obviously. Um, I told the women yesterday that I love movies that are really based on real life, you know, like Mary Poppins, you know. <laughs> A joke. I was telling them about the movie 127 Hours, but I will say to you that Elf, I will probably watch, you know, during the Christmas season because I, I just think it's funny. Very few movies do I laugh at. Like my kids, like Nacho Labre, or like whatever that's called, like, is that really funny? That's humor? I, I don't get it. But with Elf, that's how they feel about me. Like, mom, come on, seriously. But Elf, remember? Santa's coming and, and he says, this is an imposter. He says, you smell like beef and cheese. You know, what's the deal here? This isn't the real Santa. But however, what they discovered at this university is that it is an actual phenomenon. Those who suffer from this phenomenon believe that they don't deserve their success. They're successful people, that, but they don't believe that they deserve it. They believe that somehow they're phonies and that they're going to be found out. They dread being exposed as fakes, so they fear potential failure that might bring down an, just an imaginary house of cards around them. They live in a debilitating root of the fear of failure. I mean, God wants to strip us from that today. God wants us to nullify the doubt and eliminate the fear of failure. Move out like Joshua did and believe. I brought another photo. This is of um, our three grandsons with uh, our middle child. Our middle child happened to be our prodigal son. And um, wow, God has done an incredible work in our Jared. But this is his three sons. And Caleb is there in the middle. He will be 16 soon. And uh, Caleb has severe autism. And so I can tell you that your world can be turned upside down in seconds. I was watching Caleb um, on a Sunday afternoon for our kids because when they were living in Wichita, there were times that they really couldn't attend church um, and really have the experience that others had because of having a disabled child. You know, they would have to have their eyes on him at all times. He had, Caleb had and has, the typical symptoms of where he stems. So he might take a DVD player and while he's watching, uh, not a player, but while he's watching TV, uh, TV, he will take the DVD holder and he'll just do this, which is called stimming. And for uh, autistic children, because they have so much stimulation, something like that begins to calm them. He has the flapping of the arms, and you know he has the tiptoes where he stands on his tiptoes, and he's he's considered nonverbal, but he does have a few words, and it's so fascinating. When I can't understand him, I'll say, Caleb, I'm so sorry. Use your words. If I still don't understand him, I'll give him my phone. He will find my notes pages, and he will type in what he's trying to tell me. So it's not like he doesn't have it up here, but I'm telling you, for 15 years we prayed, God, would you, all that's trapped in there, would you let it come out? I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if God will ever answer that prayer. But Caleb is a precious gift to our family. But when I say that things can change in seconds, I was watching Caleb by myself when he was about seven years old. And so we're in the house, in our house, and it's just me and Caleb, 
And I had been folding some laundry in the TV room. Caleb was in the TV room. Something that he loved to do at that age was that we would put a DVD in, and he would watch just a little bit of the DVD. Then he would rewind it all the way to the credits, and he would watch all the credits. Then he would rewind, watch all the credits again. So it was, it was an interesting you know, situation with him, but obviously if that's what he wanted, this grandma wasn't going to interrupt that. And so I thought that he was very engaged in the television. And so I decided that I would leave the room. I'd been folding laundry. I was just going to go put it on my bed. I'm not joking. I'm talking like 60 seconds. I walk through the living room and our bed was on the other side of the house, our bedroom. And I, I really feel like, because I was rushing because of Caleb. I came back after laying the clothes down, came back, and our front door was standing wide open. I ran to the room. He wasn't there, so I knew he had gone outside. I go outside. I don't see him. I'm calling his name. I run through the backyard, calling out his name. There's a street in the back. I'm looking up and down the street. No Caleb. I run the cul-de-sac. I'm barefoot. I run the cul-de-sac. No Caleb. Yelling his name. Don't see him. I go back in the house. I call 911. Thankfully, I remembered what he had on. Shared with them in tears uh, what was happening. And then God just so kindly reminded me, we had a police officer. When you've got that kind of adrenaline going and you've got a grandchild that's escaped, you're not always thinking the best. But God gave me the ability to remember three doors down was a policeman, Jeff. So I ran down there to see if he was home, still barefoot, ran down. He was home. He answered. I told him the story through tears. He says, Karen, we're going to find him. Have you called 911? I said, yes. And so then he gets, he puts on his tennis shoes. He then gets on his phone and uh, just to make sure that his buddies are aware and that they're out in our neighborhood looking. He said, Karen, the fireman, the policeman, they're already on it. He will be found. It's going to be okay. He will be found. Get in the car, and we're going to go around the neighborhood. I jump in the back seat of the police car. Within just a few moments, actually, so I would say from the time he escaped, it was between 10 to 15 minutes, and he was located at the neighborhood pool. And it was a neighbor of ours that ended up calling the police saying, this isn't right. This, this is our neighbor's grandson, and he has autism. You know, he could not even, I told the police, he will not even be able to tell you his name. He won't be able to. He's got to be found. So when he was found, he was at the neighborhood pool, and we had taken the grandkids there several times. That mind of his remembered exactly how to get there. You had to cross three streets to get to that neighborhood pool. He doesn't understand danger. He could have been hit by a car. I just read an article the week before regarding a, a child with autism drowning because they don't understand. They don't have a sense of danger. So, of course, with this big pond, an aesthetic pond in our neighborhood, that's where I, my mind just went. I thought, oh, dear God, and then they find him at the pool. So when I get there, here's a grandma that's like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm bawling. I'm hugging him. And what does he say? Pool? Pool? Like, hey, grandma, can we go swimming? You know, that's what he was saying. And it's like, oh, dear Jesus, I'm taking you home, and I'm locking you in a room right now. <laughs> I got him home, and no joke, I didn't lock him in a room. But no joke, I pulled up, I got a chair out of the dining room, I set it in front of the front door, and I planted myself there, and I wasn't moving, and neither was he, until his mom or dad got there. But I will tell you that fear and courage are like railroad tracks simultaneously running down the bed of life. Courage states, I will find that boy. I was barefooted the whole time. It didn't matter. I was running over rocks. It didn't matter. I was going to find that boy. Fear says, I can't. Oh, dear God, I, I don't know what to do. If I had allowed fear to consume me, I would have called 911 and I would have been pacing the house. Oh, dear God, let, him find them. let them find him. Let them find him. That's what fear does. Fear immobilizes you. Courage got me on my feet. 
Courage got me on my feet to run out that front door. When my humor returned, I, I told my kids, I said, I have not ran that fast since I was in the seventh grade, and I won the 50-yard dash, boys and girls included. I was fast. Now, you can look at me now and know that I don't run very often anymore. Fear marginalizes your effectiveness. Fear is a reducing agent. Courage enlarges your view. It sees multiple options and it nullifies doubt. Indeed, God had promised Joshua, no one will be able to stand up against you. Do you understand that? No one will be able to stand up against you when you're following God's call. I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. So first, we have courageous transition. Secondly, courageous conviction. Seven and eight, be careful to obey all the law. Do not turn from it to the right or left. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Conviction, what is it? It's a firmly held belief. Strong convictions, solidly in the word, based in the word, precede great actions. So here are some elements of courageous conviction. Credible risk. People that are courageous and have strong conviction, they're willing to take some credible risk. What's God calling you to do? And maybe you're a little bit fearful. And I just want to say, do it afraid. Just step out and do it. Do it. Follow what God is calling you to do. Credible risk. What do risk takers have in common? They don't live in the land of predictability. They set an atmosphere waiting for things to happen. They ask, what would I attempt if it isn't about me? They say, what's the point of holding back and playing it safe? When I was dropping Caleb off on a Wednesday night, after church, I felt for a few years when our kids lived in Wichita that my ministry was on Wednesday nights when my husband was traveling and our children were going to church. I wanted them to experience church as a typical family. So they and their two other boys went. Caleb stayed with me. So I'd be at the park swinging Caleb on Wednesday night. And there was occasions where I thought, what if someone drives by and sees me, the superintendent's wife, out here on a Wednesday night, not in church, and I'm at the playground? And I had to be freed from that because that was my ministry, was to Caleb. And so I will say that on a Wednesday night when I had to meet the children at the church house in order to uh, give them Caleb so I could run a couple of errands, a young man came out, just bursting kind of out the door because he had seen me, came up, gave me a big hug. He was in his late 20s, early 30s. When my husband was district youth director of, of Kansas, this young man had attended camps every season in the summer. He would get on fire for God, and then when he would leave after a few months, down to Guinea. He, he'd struggled with alcohol. He struggled with drugs for years up until his late 20s, early 30s. Then he met Jesus in an empower, powerful way. And God empowered him. And he was in Celebrate Recovery. So that's what, when he was bounding down the stairs on that Wednesday night to come and hug me, he was coming outside from a Celebrate Recovery. And he said, oh, Karen, it's been 120 days. So he had been dry for 120 days. We were celebrating. We were high-fiving. And uh, then all of a sudden his countenance changed. And it was like from this unbelievable joy to, to just some doubt on his face. And I said, Matt, what is it? And he said, you know, I'm never going to be able to, the, to be the witness that you and Pastor Terry are. I said, oh, Matt, why would you say such a thing? And he said, well, look at me. And he had tattoos, you know, that sleeves down both arms and had tattoos neck and, and uh, all down his legs. He had shorts on that night and, and uh, on his feet, you know, on his knuckles, just everywhere. He was, he was just tatted up. And God gave me, you know, you know, we believe in the supernatural, I'm telling you, God gave me a word of knowledge in that moment that I would not have been able to say without him. 
And I looked Matt in the eyes and I said, Matt, when God redeemed you, he did not just redeem the inside of you. He redeemed all of you, including every tat on your body. And the reason he was embarrassed of the tats is because they were skulls, they were demons. I mean, they, they looked a bit frightening. I said, listen, Matt, people are going to come up to you. People that would never come up to me or to come up to my husband. And they're going to say, hey, dude, who's your ink artist? And you're going to be able to tell them the name of your ink artist. And you're going to be able to say, but hey, this is who I used to be. Can I tell you who I am today? And I am telling you what. Matt took an incredible risk and he began to tell people when they would come up and I cannot tell you how many people that Matt has been able to lead to the Lord because of his tats. Come on. God is an amazing God. He's not going to let our past dictate our future. What is God's response going to be if you take a risk for him? He's going to be your greatest cheerleader. He will be. And then number two, under courageous conviction, purposeful meditation. Meditate on the word. Joshua was to make the law of God his rule for life and conduct. I want you to hear me. Scripture in his heart gave him traction in his grief. You lose a job, sudden, unexpected, there's grief. I want to tell you, you have the scripture hidden in your heart. God's going to give you some traction in the middle of your grief. The word is a treasure, and it's not meant to be buried. It's not meant to be buried except right in here, the scripture. Meditation and reflection establish conviction and guarantees stability in God. It's not theoretical speculation. Meditation is not a mindless repetition of words or phrases, but an intense concentration on God and his ways. You know, the Bible is really a preparation manual for us for life. It's also a great textbook. Many people study the word of God, but I want to tell you, I believe God wants it to be our playbook. That every move that we make is seen through the lens of the scripture. Every move that we make. Regrettably, and maybe you know this, the statistics for Christians, Christ followers, the statistic for them reading the scripture on a consistent basis is four to seven percent. And I want to encourage you, I just have this feeling that that's not the statistic at CCC. But I want to tell you something, it is across the nation in most of our churches. This is what I want to encourage you with. If you don't have an active devotional life, I'm telling you what God will do. This is what God will do for you if you put it into practice. You are sensitive to him manifesting anywhere at any time. We broaden and deepen our understanding of God when we have a consistent devotional life. We align our thoughts with his. We maintain godly direction. It's where we gain strength. It's where we understand discernment. It's where we invite the supernatural to happen in our lives. You know what? The supernatural can take place at the YMCA. It can take place at the bank where we do business, at the dry cleaners, and even in the green bean aisle because it's happened to me. And I will tell you of a recent occurrence where I was in the green bean aisle, a woman next to me was crying. And I thought, now, you know, sometimes it is hard to pick out green beans. <laughs> but um, I, I, I thought, there's, there's more to it than this. So I just went over and I said, ma'am, I know you don't know me, but I said, are you okay? You know, I see the tears. And she said, well, she said, I'm... I'm, I'm just feel, I, I just feel scared. I said, well, I, I'm a stranger. If you don't feel comfortable opening up to me, it's okay. Um, and she said, oh, oh no, I, I would like to. I, I just dropped off some film, my little disc out of my, my camera at the lab for them to be developed, the pictures to be developed. And she said, it's, it's pictures of the last family celebration that we had, a birthday celebration. 
And my husband is in those pictures, and I've not seen my husband since he passed after that. I've not even seen a, a picture of him, and I, I kind of dread picking up those pictures and, and seeing him. And I said, ma'am, you know what? God understands. God knows your heart. Would it be okay if I just prayed for you? Now, when I laid my hand gently on her hand there on that cart, three, three aisles over, they didn't hear me yelling and screaming, right? They didn't hear me going, oh, God, <laughs> right here in this green bean aisle. <laughs> no, because the supernatural sometimes is like that. But other times the supernatural is very calm and very quiet. And God speaks in a whisper and I just laid my hand on hers and I began to pray. And you know, by the time that we finished praying, I don't even know if she was a Christ follower, but I know that God spoke to her. I'm telling you, God is a supernatural God. When we consider courageous conviction, meditation, or reflection on God's word, don't just stay true to who you are, which is important, but stay true to who God is and what God has promised. In the early 80s, we were at Central Bible College, and we had two, we had more than two friends, but two friends of ours, quite intelligent, uh, leadership giftings, highly affable individuals, fun to be around. They both went into ministry. Years later, we discovered that both of them had got out of ministry. Today, they're not living by the convictions they once held on those Bible college grounds. One fixated on Eastern religion, especially Hinduism and reincarnation. The other one, a cynical universalist. And if they were to stand behind this pulpit today, this is what they would say. They would say, because I've seen it on their Facebook, they have been liberated from falsehood. Do you see what happens when we don't stay rooted in the truth? when we don't stay rooted in who God is. And I got to thinking when they deviated from convictions, was it possible that they began to drift when they elevated the ideas of man over the authority of God's word? I plead with you, guard your heart. It does not matter if the most famous talk show host on television tells you that there's more than one way to heaven. It does not matter if the most elite in Hollywood tells you that there is no God. I am telling you, friends, please, if that's influence to you, turn it off, ignore it, and stay true to the word of God. Guard your heart. And a final application in this passage, courageous interaction. Verse 2, now then, you and all these people, get ready. So he's talking to Joshua, but he's including the community of the Israelites. This is what I want you to hear this morning. Spiritual community is indispensable. What steps are involved in courageous interaction? First, we must eliminate isolation Find your tribe. Your tribe is right here. If this is your church, CCC, find your tribe. This is a large church, three services. You're not going to be able to be best buds with everyone, but you can be best buds with a few and let them speak into your life and you speak into their life and make sure that you're holding true to the promises of God. We need a tribe. Doing it all by yourself can be impossible. It's viable to stay focused and optimistic, and the best follow-through comes by belonging to a spiritual community. I'm telling you, I can tell in one weekend, this is a safe place where you can belong, where you can believe, and where you can become. And finally, courageous interaction includes affirm goodness. Look for Look for what you can affirm in each other. Oh my word, we live in a culture and a society that they're constantly looking for the negative. God, help us. Help us as the body of believers to look for the good in others and to affirm God's goodness and his faithfulness to us. And then exercise allegiance. Joshua learned from his mentor the importance of relationship 
with God over everything else. God over everything else. Would you just say that with me? God over everything else. Part of our allegiance to Jesus involves connecting others to him. Did you know that the gospel didn't come to us to just find a resting place? The gospel came to us for us to embrace it and for it to go to the next place. Continual, continually uplifting the name of Jesus. So verse 9 says, have I commanded you be strong and courageous, don't be afraid. These are orders that are not trifling. They are not trifling issues open to debate. Don't be afraid or dismayed. He's giving Joshua really an order. Don't be, don't allow the voice of the enemy to discourage you. So I end with this. Keep coming back to this reality. You are not alone. He will never leave you without direction. He will never leave you to battle it out alone. He will never leave you in the pit by yourself. He will never leave you to face opposition without his power. He will never leave you to figure it out on your own. And he will never leave you. He will never leave you. Would you bow your heads with me? Perhaps this is your first time to CCC. I don't know. But I'm telling you, God is in this place. Not because Karen Nancy's here. Not because of the wonderful worship team. God is in this place because he made a choice to be in this place. He wants to be in this place because he loves you. He sees you as individuals. And he knows exactly what you're going through. There are some in this place that I just sense have not crossed the line. You've not crossed the line and you've not said, I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I need to repent of my sin. I need to repent. I need him. I'm struggling with fear and I know I need to run to him. I need a change in my lifestyle. So this is what I want to ask. There's this wonderful worship team. There's this wonderful group of people here to pray with you. And I'm going to join them in just a moment. And this is what I want to say. If you're here today and you want to experience Jesus in a relationship that will change your life, that will change the trajectory of your life, I just want you with heads bowed, eyes closed, I want you just to raise your hand. Is that you in the place today? Is there someone here that you would say, that's me? God knows. Let me ask you this. Perhaps you have an issue. Perhaps you're dealing with fear. Perhaps you've not meditated on the word in a long time. Perhaps you don't have a consistent devotional life. And you would say, today is the day. I'm, I've, I've got a line in the sand. I'm going to step over that line. And as Pastor Joy leads us in this concluding song, would you come forward? Don't let fear pin you to your seat. Come forward and let's receive what God has for us. God bless you.